Let's just take a peruse through some electrostatic potential maps here. Um, this is water. You can see the hydrogen end is blue. The oxygen end is red, showing you know, uh, that this is a polar molecule, uh, one. And that is um, <coughs> the electron cloud is skewed towards oxygen. And so the oxygen is negative. Here, the hydrogens are positive. Electrostatic potential maps, it's not just um, determining polarity. Electrostatic potential maps show you uh, much more detail. Uh, that is, when we get into this, we can see the orbitals that are involved and how this water molecule may react with things like uh, acids, with bases, with metals, you know, like potassium metal or sodium metal. And so we get a lot of uh, chemical information as well as uh, physical properties because this being polar, you know, water has a, a strong intermolecular attraction to the other water molecules. And so uh, just to reiterate, we get um, physical information and chemical information. The chemical information is in there and we'll see it when we look at this in greater detail. Okay, this is from a program called Spartan, which we have. Uh, we have Spartan. It's an expensive program, but uh, it's very powerful. Here we have um, lithium hydride. Lithium hydride would be you know, considered ionic, right? Lithium plus, H minus, lithium hydride. And when you look at the potential map, it looks that way. H off, this is what we'd call polar covalent. H2 would be nonpolar covalent. This is another one where we can see uh, is this one. This is uh, actually trichloroacetic acid. And acetic acid has an oxygen and a hydrogen. You know, this carbon with a double bond and uh, like an OH group to it. So acetic acid is, at least th this is the hydrogen here, is quite acidic. In fact, this trichloroacetic acid is much more powerful than acetic acid itself. Uh, trichloroacetic acid, like a strong acid. Okay, so we'll just do a quick uh, sampling of different electrostatic potential maps here. SO2 we saw before. Uh, here's ammonia down at the bottom. This is a very polar molecule as well. This is um, chloromethane is a polar. You can see the color scale there. You have delta plus and delta minus for the charges. From these quantum mechanic programs, uh, we could get numbers for these rather than you know, guess that's you know, delta partial positive, partial negative. But um, this, the electrostatic potential map, will give us a number for the charge yeah. in computational. Here, oh, what is this? Do you recognize this? H2CO3. H2CO3 is carbonic acid. This would be bicarbonate here. This is carbonate. You can see in carbonate, there isn't a double and two singles. Each bond is equivalent. You can see how symmetric the electrostatic potential map here. Each bond is a one and a half bond order here. And the charge on the oxygens here, the charge on the oxygens, you look at them, they, it looks the same. It isn't a negative one, negative one, and zero. It's a, a negative two thirds, negative two thirds, negative two thirds. When we look at um, bicarbonate, one of the um, mistakes that's commonly made with bicarbonate is when people come up with resonance forms of bicarbonate, they move the hydrogen. You can see the hydrogen is stuck here, but what they end up doing is they move the hydrogen around the molecule. That's not a resonance you know, form. You know, in a resonance, the um, atoms stay put, and you move the electrons. And so bicarbonate, this hydrogen is fixed here. We don't move that. But we, we can see, though, that um, in, in this case, these two oxygens are equivalent. Do you see the, uh, 
negative charge build up on these two. And when we look at the structure of bicarbonate, it looks like this. If I were to draw it, like they show it there. Is it? I'll tie it. Now, normally we, we would uh, come up with a Lewis structure that looks like this with a negative formal charge on this oxygen. And then we would have um, two resonance forms for this. Which switches the double bond over and then uh, places the negative formal charge on the other oxygen. And then some people might say there's potentially three here. Is if I move the double bond over here, that is, if I drop these electrons into the bond, maybe that would give me another. So take these electrons, move them into the bond, kick these electrons out over here. So we do that, we end up with this. So are these three resonance forms? Well, yeah, potentially. Um, we see these two here, but when we look at the formal charges here, this is negative, this is negative, and now the oxygen's positive. Does this formal charge distribution look okay? What do you think of this formal charge distribution? Uh, in fact, it doesn't look good. I mean, can you give an argument why this structure doesn't look so good? It should be very unstable. And that is, you know, when we're thinking about a tug of war, let's, let's compare it to this structure here. In this tug of war, this oxygen ends up losing an electron to this oxygen. We'll keep this oxygen the same. Does that make sense? No, it, it seems like this would be quite unstable. And um, we, we wouldn't con consider this a significant contributor. In fact, you know, electron density, you, you know, electron density spreads out, right, when we're thinking about the hybrid. And uh, y y we wouldn't think about much electron density spreading out into this bond here. This bond here. When you look at the electrostatic potential map, here, did much of the uh, electron density spread out over here? Did we get a lot of blue on the, because, you know, if that oxygen there is positively charged, this should be quite, what color? Blue. And so what this, this says is, you know, this has got to be too high in energy to be even considered a, a, a potential contributor to the hybrid. Even though, yeah, we can have non-equivalent contributors to hybrids like we saw for nitrous oxide, but this one is too unstable. And so it looks like these two are it. But it looks like neither of these structures is correct. This is the failing, one of the failings, quote unquote, of uh, valence bond theory. Valence bond theory is uh, based on these Lewis you know, structures. And, um, and what we see is that neither of these structures is correct. You know, because what we don't have is, if we could freeze this in time, we don't have the negative on one oxygen and then the negative on the other. And, and we don't have a bond that resonates shorter and longer, shorter and longer as it goes double single. In fact, if you look at the two bonds, the two bonds are the same length. And the bond length is halfway, well, roughly halfway. The bond length is roughly halfway between a single and a double, so we call it a one and a half bond. The bond energy is like that too. But in, in, um, it turns out, it, it, it's, it, excuse me, it turns out that um, there's additional stability from this electron cloud delocalization here, which makes the bond stronger than you might think because of this delocalization. And so the hybrid of this is going to look like this. The hybrid. where we have these two bonds equivalent, and then the double bonded electrons are shared between the two. And each of these will have two lone pairs fixed, and then some additional electron density here. So this is going to come out to minus one half. 
minus one half. In the bond order, these are 1.5 bonds, one and a half bonds. Be more accurate representation by carbonate. There's some more complex molecules that we can see, the less complex water. This is showing a little bit more. You know, this is our standard electrostatic potential map here. But what this is showing is it's showing the orbitals that are involved here. These are strange looking orbitals if you look at them. These orbitals here, these come from molecular orbital theory, in which if you look at the orbitals, the orbitals are quite big. They span the whole molecule. It's so H2SO4 and acetic acid. H2SO4 is a much stronger acid. Um, you can take a look at the hydrogen, the acidic hydrogen. Acetic acid, look at the uh, <coughs> blue here versus H2SO4, the blue here. The much more intense blue on the sulfuric acid, which is a strong acid, etc. All right, and so we have some electrostatic potential maps, and um, <coughs> these are great, but. Uh, what are we going to do? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to try to generate as much detailed information by hand as possible. You know, what can we do on pencil and paper versus um, calculations? And so what we'll do is we'll just learn uh, about drawing the orbitals here. You know, S orbitals are just spherical, so there's no problem with drawing an S orbital. In fact, Do that here. We're going to focus on, let's say, the 2s here. If, if we just represent the 2s, we're not going to show the 2. Spheres here. We're just going to show one. Show something like the 95% probably probability boundary, you know, which is the outer surface here of the S. Then we'll look at the P orbitals here. Looking at the P orbitals, uh, this red doesn't bounce so clear. There's one s orbital in here as well, which is going to be smaller. It would be in here somewhere. I'm not going to show it right now, but let's show the p orbitals. I'm going to have three p orbitals, and they're going to be oriented on different axes. And so one of the p orbitals will place on this axis here, let's say. That, um, axis. So this is one lobe of the p orbital here. This would be the other lobe here. This would be a P orbital here. Like a 2PX. Uh, but I'm not going to put in the coordinate for this right hand. Uh, maybe I will. It's 2PX. And then the Y, you can see here, it's on this axis. And so um, you're going to have one load coming out. Now this load coming out, you know, I'd like to uh, shade it differently. I shouldn't have shaded this one, but 
what we'll do is we'll try to shade this coming out like this. And so this is coming out, and then this love is going in to the plane. Then we have the PZ, which is in the plane. And so, PZ is here. Just to. So the PX and the PZ are in the plane. The PY is coming out the plane here. Those are the orbitals there. Uh, what other orbitals should I be able to draw? I want to draw a D orbital here. You can see they're different shapes. Four of the Ds look like a four-leaf clover, like this. You see the four-leaf clover? There's kind of a perspective drawing there. Um, one of the five is going to have an unusual shape here. It has a little donut. It looks like a P orbital with a donut ring in the center. So, that be it. So, let's see what all five things look like. Good. If you look at the four leaf clover, then um, there are different orientations on the XYZ coordinate system. If the four lobes line up on the X, and the y axis. Do you see how they line up on the x and y axis? That's called the dx squared minus y squared. They're right on the axis. This is the only one that lines up on the axis. Uh, take a look at the dxy. And how does the dxy compare to the dx squared minus y squared? The dxy is just rotated. You take this one and rotate it 45 degrees. Now you rotate it 45 degrees, and then the lobes stick not on the axis. The lobes stick between the axis. So this lobe here was originally on the axis, and we rotate it for 45. Now do you see it's stuck right between the two axes here. It's in the same plane. And so um, this is where the configuration, uh, the nomenclature comes from, dxy, the xy plane. So we have four-leaf clover in the xy plane. But we have to differentiate it because we have two of these in the xy plane, this one and this one. They're both in the xy plane. And so we call this one the dx squared minus y squared. Now take a look at the dxz. The dxz, we take this and then rotated this way, 90 degrees, and now it's in the plane of the screen. This one's perpendicular to the screen. This one's now in the plane. And so it's in the XZ. And again, it's between the axes, not on the axes. And then if we take this one, rotate it 90 degrees this way, then we'll have this one. This one's perpendicular. The YZ plane comes perpendicular to the page. And so these two lobes stick out, these two lobes stick in. And then finally, we have the dz squared here. dz squared, which has this little hula hoop, but it's on the z axis here. And so this, these are the five d orbitals. And so essentially, it's like this, you know. Um, you got the S, the P, and then the D. You know, the D doesn't start at 2. There's no 2D orbital. And so uh, it's going to start at 3. And so if we go to uh, N equals 3, the orbitals are going to be bigger. And so rather than looking at a 2S, we're looking at a 3S. 3S orbital is bigger. And we're going to just look at the outer surface. Because in an n equals 3, 3s three orbital, how many nodes are there? Internal nodes. There are two internal nodes, which we aren't going to show. Uh, we're just going to show the outermost. And then we're going to have the 3p orbitals. So here's one 3p orbital. We would call the 3px, right? Or just the 3p orbital here. All right, just uh, to more clearly show this, let's put a little pattern on this so we can see 3P orbitals. 
And then we're going to have another 3p orbital here. This. And so here, I'm going to use a different pattern for this one. This would be the pz. And then the py, the py would stick out like this. So to show this lobe sticking out, I'm going to try to shade it on the edge here like this. And to show this lobe sticking in, I'm going to dash it like that. And so this is another 3p, this is another 3p. And then we have our 3d orbitals. The 3D orbital, um, how should I draw that? Well, let's just draw maybe uh, one of them or two of them. One of them I'm going to draw, I'm going to draw the DXZ. The DXZ is going to be all in the plane. So the DXZ is going to have four lobes. It's just one orbital, so the maximum, even though it has four lobes, the maximum capacity of this orbital is just, is just how many electrons? This is in the plane, so I'm going to put some kind of pattern here to clearly see it. This would be just one 3D orbital, the 3 dxz. Okay with these orbitals? Now we're going to draw some more orbitals. So here you can see the s orbital, the p orbital, p orbital, p orbital. The s and the p orbitals. In, in valence bond theory, um, some new orbitals can be generated. Uh, these new orbitals that can be generated are generated due to hybridization of these unhybridized, we call these unhybridized orbitals. And so if we take it, it's, it's kind of like when you make the hybrid, you know, the hybrid structure from the resonance forms. The resonance hybrid is going to be like this. What we're going to do is we're just going to take these and mix them together. In other words, hybridize them. And the hybrid is going to be like this. If we hybridize these four orbitals, then it's going to be three parts P and one part S. And we'll make these hybrid orbitals. And so the hybrid orbitals, we, what we want to do at this stage is just learn how to draw out the hybrid orbitals. And then we'll talk about why hybridize. But in addition to our standard, these are our standard, the S, the P, the D, those are our standard unhybridized orbitals. Now you have to learn the, the hybrid orbitals. And so the first set of hybrid orbitals we're going to look at are the SP hybrid orbitals. Now I'm going to go out of order here. And so we just take an S orbital and P orbital and we, we make a hybrid orbital out of that. And so if we take two orbitals, like an S and a P, we're going to get two hybrid orbitals. And the two hybrid orbitals look like this. If I mix this, do you see it's blue? And I mix this, on the left it's red, and on the right it's blue. 
And what does the red and blue indicate here? In orbitals, what does the red and blue indicate? No, in electrostatic, in electrostatic potential maps, red and blue represent that. But in orbitals, red and blue represent something else. Did anybody catch that? It has something to do with positive and negative, and what is it exactly? Polarity. No, it's not polarity. Can you can you see if you have it in your notes? Just just want to see. Um, 